Really glad to be here this morning. How's that, Jerry? We good? Huh? You're good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here this morning because you're glad to be here this morning. We've been through some changes here, and it seems like the people who are here this morning are the people that want to be here, despite the changes that are going on. And so it's kind of like, I feel like I'm among family, that you all want to be here, and that we're the ones that are going to carry on the work of this ministry, and just watch it increase and grow. We're that, we're that remnant to carry that on. And... Uh, I'm going to set the timer on my phone. It's a, it's a, a stopwatch. So it's at zero now, and I'm going to start it. So that you think that, that it's going to mean anything? I'm just going to go until as long as I can. I just don't want to go too long. I want to thank Maddie and um, Denise for sharing those scriptures. There is, in the Synoptic Gospels, we have other incidents of that story about take no thought for your life. And it's in the, um, the Mark accounting of it. It's preceded with um, where the Lord said that um, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So take no thought for tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, as a young believer, and I read, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I, and I thought, oh, wait a second. I don't like the idea of evil and of a sufficient amount of evil in any day, let alone today or whatever day it is. And so for years, that troubled me. I I began to anticipate something bad. Jesus said it. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There will be plenty of evil tomorrow to deal with. So don't worry about tomorrow's evil because you're going to have enough evil to deal with today. That's what it sounded like to me. Until this morning. So I want to see what does that Greek word actually mean there? And it's a Greek word that's kakia, K-A-K-I-A, and it's used only that one time. It's translated evil only once. It's only used once in the Bible. And it, it means wickedness as an evil habit of the mind. It's something that we're thinking. It's an evil habit of having a negative resolve, having a fear that things aren't going to work right, that somehow things are going to go bad. I live with Murphy's Law. Is what that's saying. When G- Does Jesus have a Murphy's Law? Did, did, well, now, did he know things were going to go bad? Yes. And he got in front of it. The lamb that was slain before... Everything fell apart. He was in front of that problem. And because God got in front of that problem for us, why do we live as if we're going to have to deal with it in some way that we're on our own, that we've been left alone? Be careful what we we think and how we look look, look at things. We're going through some some adjustments, some changes, some things that, that, that might seem a little uncomfortable. Because it's unfamiliar. I like the familiar. The, the, the house that I've lived in for the past 12 years, it's, a, it's also my place of business. It's a commercial building that's zoned residential as well as commercial. First floor is offices. Second floor is my residence where I live with Cameron. I've lived there for 12 years. That's the longest I've ever lived anywhere except the house that I grew up in, in Hinsdale. And it's become familiar. I know exactly what, what day the trash comes. Whereas before, it's like, what day? Was it, it, what, is it? No, as I know. It's like a routine. 
I know the sound of the steps going up, the squeak of each, each one of the landings on the stairs. It's very reassuring. It's very comforting. I know exactly when the daffodils are going to come up. And I know exactly what, how many leaves we're going to have and how many bags we're going to need to deal with the leaves. I know all of that. I see it all. Very familiar. It's very comforting. And I get my bearings very naturally, very easily. Because it's familiar to me. We all like things that are, that are familiar. We can count on it. It's reliable. But then change, things, things change. And we don't like it so much. Because we get, we kind of like, we lose our bearings. I like the familiar. I don't really want to live anywhere else. I don't want to have to move again. We like this place. We like this group. We like this message. We like these, we, we like us. And the idea of a change that's very discomforting. We lose our bearings. We, we get like vertigo at the, at the mere thought of something, you know, changing like this. I like it stable. But yet, God says, I'm doing a new thing. Anything that can be shaken will be, sh- will be shaken. We can see that throughout the scriptures. And there's a reason for that. You prune things. They grow better. You shake off the old, make room for the new. And so that's a good thing. It's, it's separating the wheat from the chaff. That's you pound the, the, the grain and bl- flip it up in the air. The wind blows the chaff away. You get your grain. Things that can be shaken ought to be shaken and will be shaken because then the, 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 the real pure remains. There's a skimming of the dross. There's a changing of things. Well, we've been changed internally. But the, the things around us are subject to change. And that's not a bad thing. Because we can get so set in the familiar and the predictable and the things that we know that it becomes a carnal, re- repetitive exercise. And you see, that can, go, that can work against you too. Well, the spirit blows like the wind and you just see the effects of it. The wind can go this way and then that way and this way and that way all in, in, in two minutes. No, I want the wind going this way. Our wind only goes, no, this is, what, this is how our wind goes. I don't want that. I want, I want it free to go wherever the Spirit wants to go. We want to go with that. So God says, behold, I do a new thing. You know, I said a little more than that. Where I did write some notes down. Um, The, he makes things new. That was changing it. He always changes things and makes things new. Wherever he shows up, he makes things come alive. He brings light. He brings healing, restoration, life, increase, abundance, prosperity. He's a God of life. Look, look what he did to the planet. I mean, his life is everywhere, from the tiniest to the, to the, to the greatest. He gives life, and each kind reproducing after itself, and it's, it's, it's always multiplying. So how can he, what is new about what he's doing when he said, I'm the God that changes not? We're, we're in the midst of a change here, and so I want to remind us that change is always good. The consequence of change is better. All things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. How many of you are how many of you love God? How many of you are called according to his purpose? Every hand should go up. You don't have to raise your hands. I'm just it's a rhetorical question. We know that. So are all things working together for good? Yes. Does it look like that? Well, I don't know. I guess. Does it? Maybe. I can't tell. I don't know. Do we need to know? If we know the one who's, who's doing the changes. You don't have to fear what the future holds when you know the one who holds the future. 
and he's good. Everything he does, he sits back and he admires it. That's very good. Where the verse did, where, and God said, and God did, and he went, oh. Okay, the redo, do over. Well, he, might, he repented that he made man, but that's a different, that's subject for a different conversation. But he doesn't change. Now, here in the world, we have to have plan A, but then have the backup plan. We all have spare tires in our cars, right? You have save, you can save for a rainy day. It would change that to just save anyway because it's, 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 uh, it's prudent, it's frugal. God has one plan. He's always had one plan. He's one God with one purpose and one idea. It's huge, but it's one idea. He's not capricious. He's not changing his mind about things. Oh, maybe I'll do this. Maybe we'll do that. No, he did it all perfectly. We're being made conformable to his will. We're, we're, We're... being made to be, think, and act, and speak more like he does. He wants us to think like him. He's trying to bring us to him. He's, he's not the God who just does whatever we say. He's not a genie in the bottle. We want to know what his will is. What is he thinking about it? What is, where is he going? What is he doing? We want to be free in the spirit to go with where, what his plan is. His plan is the same plan that it, that it always was. Now, we have our familiar surroundings, our familiar environment, the, thing, the way we think we want life to go. And he's re- he gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of license. He made us free to do whatever we wanted. But we're here doing, we are here to seek to do what he wants. We want his will, not our will. Because when we do what we want to do solely based upon our own passions and desires, it usually doesn't work out well. People spoil everything. God is trying, what he's wanting to do is his original plan. All throughout the whole history of the Bible, it's been one plan. Here's what, what Maddie read. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord. That's plural. What, isn't there just one tabernacle? Well, let's, uh, how amiable are thy places where you are. Places where mm, we come together. Multiple places. So God can believe more places than once, than, than one. Tabernacles, plural. How amiable, how it, we get along well in that house with him. Multiple places. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the, the courts of the Lord. Now that's, that's not like a court of law. That's not, you know, Judge Wapner or the people's court. The courts of the Lord. That's where he is. That's where we think of him, you know, just sitting on the throne up there somewhere. But he has courts with trees. He has got rivers, mountains. It's the garden, the Garden of Eden. That's where his councils are. Wherever he is, it's beautiful like that. He doesn't just like leave the throne when he's going to go appear to some prophet. He didn't say, okay, let's see, toothbrush, passport. Okay, we're ready. I'll be back, tells all the angels. And then he goes down, he makes his appearance and does his thing, and he goes back there. No, wherever he goes, his presence goes with him. His counsels are with him. There's there's courts, amiable tabernacles. Uh, it's It's a beautiful place wherever he is with all of his accoutrement, and his counsels, all the angels and stuff. He goes, he brings that with him, wherever he is. And it's, we think in terms of locations. You know, we think of Mount Zion and um, Jerusalem and these places where specified where he's going to be. He is, wherever he shows up, he brings all of him there. 
It's like Air Force One. Do you know, have you seen pictures of Air Force One? How many have ever seen, seen it? Well, do you know that um, we think of the big blue jet, that, you know, but whatever plane the President of the United States is on, because he can get in other planes and take other planes or helicopters, do you know what those are called? Air Force One. Air Force One is wherever, wherever the President of the United States is, whatever plane it is. Well, he represents all of the United States. He represents all of our military, uh, the House, the, the Senate, everything, the whole deal. It's him. He's got the authority of the United States wherever he shows up, wherever he is. It's like the ambassador of another country is the ambassador of the United States in Turkey. Th that land where that embassy is is considered American soil. And it's a little microcosm of America right there. We don't conform to do like what the Turkish uh, government and, and culture and stuff is. So wherever an ambassador is, it's like the U.S. And wherever the president is, it's the whole United States. Wherever God is, it's the whole glory of God right there, wherever he is. Now, we think of him as moving and showing up here or there. Where is he right now? Oh, I don't know. What do you think God's doing right now? He's right here, folks. The, the invisible realm has no boundaries or dimension to it. All of these things that are true about God, where he hangs, where he does, what he likes, his surroundings, it's present here right now with us. He's just wanting to be with us. He wants us to be with him. His will done on earth as it is in heaven. We see the beginning of his, of his plan in, with the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, with this, the, the first man and woman. And the whole idea was, here's the, here's the, here's the earth, have dominion over it, be fruitful, multiply. It's all yours. That's his plan. Well, what happened? Well, it didn't go so well. People spoil things. They got corrupted. And what's he been trying to do ever since then? Did he have another plan? Oh, he screwed the earth thing up. Well, now what am I going to do? No, that's still what he's trying to do. He's, he wants to be with us. He wanted to be our God, us to be his people, and have the garden. That's his one plan, and he's still working it. I'm the Lord, I change not. He wants to be our God, wants us to be his people, so much so that all through the whole biblical saga, ultimately bringing Christ here, he so became uh, into to be one with us that he came incarnate to be able to put his spirit into us through Christ so that he could dwell with us and so that we could live together with him and have actually have Eden restored in a heavenly sense. This earth was corrupted, was cursed. There will be a new heaven. There will be a new earth. Now, that's, that's a change. We, we're familiar with this earth. We like it here. And God is trying to get us to see past the earth, past the way we're accustomed to doing things. Things are going to change. There, the, the, the elements will melt. This earth is going to pass away, but there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, that doesn't mean a heaven like where he lives, because that never got corrupted. But the heavens that are above us with the sky and the universe, um, that will be new. The new earth, this, there will be a new, a new earth. Because he's in the new business. This is, when you got saved, the old things have passed away. Behold, everything's new, and all things are of God. Well, it doesn't look like that. Yeah, but it's true. Because now you're changed from the inside out. Everything else around you, we're, we're, to, we're, we're to be, not to cling to this world, to the things here. We, we like it familiar. Why do we like it familiar? We like things that don't change. 
we, we, want, we want to be able to count on the future. We try to do it with our own strength, with our own money. You know, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, if I had a lot of treasure, I'd be a lot more secure about the future. Not really. Moth and rust can corrupt that. It can get stolen, it can get robbed, you can die, and then it's not going to make any difference anyways. But there is something in us. We want to have some stability. Because we don't want to be, have an evil thought of worrying about tomorrow. But the stability comes from the rock. I am the Lord, I change not. He's got one plan. God with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to be in us. He wants to be our God. He wants to provide for us. He wants to lead us in the way that we should go. He wants to be the, our, our light. He, he wants to spread his love through us to the others. He wants intimacy. I was thinking this morning about words and why we use words and what they are. Something in the, in the human being, in our, in our thoughts, in our consciousness, we want to coalesce our thoughts into some kind of a form of something that we can convey to another person to engender intimacy. There's something natural within us that wants intimacy with each other. Certainly in, the, you know, in a marriage, but in a fellowship. We were made for fellowship. We're social creatures. It's a beautiful thing for the brethren to dwell together, the Lord. He takes delight in our fellowship around him. Something in our thoughts, in our minds, we have a yearning to want to be closer together. Well, where did that come from? We're made in the image and the, and the likeness of God. He has a yearning and a desire to be close to us. Parents, think of your children when they were little. You couldn't squeeze them or kiss them enough. Nobody had to teach you to do that. This is ingrained into us for that kind of an, an, an affectionate, intimate, close kind of relationship. God has that for us. That's what he wants, desires for us. We talked this summer, uh, and some of you were, most of you were here when I taught downstairs, and I, I, uh, I just kind of covered it really fast, but I talked about the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, bet. And it's a picture it, 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 it looks like a, uh, like, a, like a little house. It's almost like the letter, capital letter B, but it's open on one end. So it, it looks like there's a round room down here. There's an open part here with this dividing point. So you could go in here, then there's a divider in here, and then here's this little house in there. It's, it's a letter B, which is where we get Beth, like house, Beth L, house of God. And so Beth means, means a house. The, 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 the little dividing thing is the, the, the women and the children would live safely on the other side of that, whereas the man would guard the entrance, the front of it. That's the home. That's the house. That's what God wants for us, to be with us. Um... That's what tabernacle is. When we think of the tabernacle, we think of the tent and we think of the holy place and the holy of holies and the sacrifices. It's just the portable church thing, the presence of God. But it's basically so God and man could dwell together. Now, God instructed Moses to make it that way because in order for us to dwell, we have a sin problem. So you have these... Uh, morning and evening offerings of, of the lambs where they'd you know, uh, burn them in, in front of it before you could get in there. You had, there had to be a shedding of blood before you could get in to the house. And only the father, the chief, the, the high priest could get into the Holy of Holies once a year. All God's wanting to do is to get us in the house with him to live without sin. 
the more we complicate it, the more we're, we're delaying the goal that really God just wants to be with us and us with him to, to have a happy time, to have the garden time, to have the whole earth with him being our God, us being his people, and he provides everything for us. That's not a complicated message. Children can understand that. But we've confused things. The church has confused things a lot. And there is a lot of changes going on. One of the biggest changes that happened for me was listening to the radio and hearing Jim Kirkwood talking about the love of God and the grace of God in scriptures that I knew, that I had read a lot. But the message was getting all scrambled up before it, 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 it wasn't making enough sense to me because it didn't comport to my simple understanding that God loved me and that he'd saved me, yet I was still confused, I still felt distance from him, still felt guilt of sins, and it was, it was all confusing to me. But it was a big change. The, I could see clear through the scriptures, I could see the love of God, clear through from, uh, all the way from Genesis to Concordance. That was a joke. Don't you have some of your Bibles have a concordance at the end? Um, now, I, I, I didn't go to a regular church uh, ever, except for weddings and funerals and stuff. I, I went to non-denominational churches, and um, there was something that attracted me to that because I saw some glimmers of life that was different from what I saw in the conventional churches or, or around, you know? There was a liberty that I saw. There was a freedom in the spirit. There was a curiosity about the scriptures. There was, uh, people were really serious about going to church. They wouldn't miss a service. There was something that I saw there. But yet it was still leading me back into legalism and bondage to Galatianism and stuff until I, until I heard Jim. So now, John's gone, and God bless him. His, you know, his vision is, is really clear about the, the fact that these uh, kids are going to college and in their first semester, they're completely turning their back on the Lord, completely renouncing their faith, and they're just going head, headlong into uh, what the, the world is dishing out with their, um, with, through philosophy, science, um, all kinds of other stuff, worldly stuff. Smart stuff, intelligent stuff, but it's not, it's antichrist, it's not Christ stuff. And that's troubling because we're thinking, well, didn't we raise them right? Didn't we, they're saved, we, they, you know, we, they knew the scriptures, raise up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old they won't depart from it, but they are departing, they have departed. Um, we see mega churches. Or just a few years ago, they were just springing up and every town had a big megachurch and satellite ministries and TV stuff. And now, it's when the time you hear about them, it's with a scandal. And that's really tragic. You know, any, any, anybody associated with the gospel, when, when they do something bad like that, whether it's financial or they're doing some kind of something immoral, sexual issues, um, people getting on power trips and pride and whatever takes over. I don't, we don't need to specify it because we can all, we've all heard, read about some of these bigger churches of visible ministries and it's really sad. There's a change, there's changes happening. I personally wouldn't want to go to a church like that if the, if the senior staff members are living, uh, you know, deceitfully, having two lives. I wouldn't want to go to a church like that. But the wheels are coming off of those ministries, and I think it's a good thing. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. And I say bring it on, actually. Because it's not glorified God. It's not, it's not the righteousness of God that's going on there. And the world sees that. You know, stereotypes don't come out of nowhere. 
and when the media and the world and the, the way that they stereotype the church, the church, it's not that far off, the way the church has been. You know, I'm just saying, the, the mainline denominations and the, the hypocrisy that seems so easy to find, um, the shallow uh, churches. But people are smarter than that. How long are they going to put up with that? The kids, the kids, they go to college and they, they find the world is actually very exciting. And I'm not saying the world in the worldly way, but the sciences, technologies, it's very, I mean, I'm a scientist. My dad was a, was a, was a doctor and a scientist. I, I was raised by really smart mom and dad. And I have appreciation for the sciences. They pointed to God for me. It, was, it made me that much more curious. How did this get here? What is this? What is going on? That kind of um, curiosity, I don't think the church has cultivated it enough. I think they've put a damper on science. I think they've put a damper on a lot of cultural things. I think they've, they've overemphasized uh, areas and used legalism to keep kids um, in fear or bondage about, about things that if they knew more of Jesus and knew more about the Holy Spirit and knew more about the love of God, that the, the book of nature would, would confirm what they knew of the scriptures and of the Jesus that saved them inside instead of trying to steal them away from it. I'm not afraid of the sciences. I'm not afraid of the Hubble telescope or the electron microscope. God made everything. He gave us all things richly to enjoy. And if you look at it right, it glorifies God. If you look at it right. But if your basis in, in the scriptures, if, it's, if, it's, um, if you've got a little Jesus, the world's going to pull you right away from that. So John has a passion for that. I think he's getting in front of a problem that we should have been able to have seen coming a long time ago, to get in front of it. Now, Kanye West um, is uh, turning a lot of heads. Kanye West, a Chicago guy, he's a rapper, came up with a new album that I listened to. Couldn't really understand what he was saying, and I, you know, it was a little bit, I'm a musician, and, I, and it was a di- whole other kind of a thing. It's a different art form for me. But I figured the people who like that, they're going to, they're going to, because he's preaching the gospel through his lyrics of his new song. And his idea of a church service that he's having, that he's having, have anybody seen, you know what Kanye West is doing now with his ministry? He's having big, he's been doing this for a while, Sunday meetings, and it's apparently it, there's been invitation only because there's a lot of uh, people, the celebrity worship crowd, want to come in on his things. But he, he has uh, his preaching and, 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 and beautiful singing. He's, he's a singer and musician, you know. And I saw a clip of one of his services that he had at some big amphitheater in L.A. or somewhere like that. It was just maybe 10 days ago. Because I said, what is, what is a Kanye West church service <laughs> got to be like, you know? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't question that the guy, I'm in hearing from the people who know the pastors and stuff that he's hanging around with. No, this guy's for real. He's made a real, real change in his life for God. So I thought, what does this look like? One of his services that he does. Where he's getting people together and they sing and they preach. So they had this big amphitheater and they had a, a, a light. Actually, it was a big square translucent panel that was hanging maybe 30 feet above the floor of this big uh, amphitheater. And that, the thing, that light was maybe the size of this room. And so it was above, about 30 feet above. And it was white, so it was translucent. And the lights were above that, you know. So then you had the big bright lights above that being diffused by that big panel, lighting this whole thing with a beautiful, soft, bright light. It was round in the middle, big round thing. And they were, they were all in an area about the size of, our, of this, you know, of all of us here. And surrounded, uh, surrounding it in a circle was green live plants and flowers. 
like they had a landscaper come in all around. It was beautiful. And there was about a couple of hundred people all wearing white robes with mics like this, wireless mics, and a band in there. And they're all singing really good Jesus songs. It was contemporary, but it was really good Jesus songs. And they were singing like as good as it gets. Great talent. And they were all wearing white, so it was nobody, and nobody was like, I'm the special singer. No, all equal, all just people worshiping God together. It was, wow, it was stunning. It went on for an hour and 45 minutes. I watched about 20 minutes, and I, and I realized this is something you want to get out of the way of. You want to let it roll. Let it roll. It's not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, that's, I'm doing something new. Now, young people who know Kanye West as the, the, the singer and the Kardashian, I don't know all that, but he's the Kardashian, married a Kardashian, and they've got all their controversy and all their Twitter and Pinterest and whatever they do. I don't even know what they do. I couldn't tell you why they're famous. I have no idea why any of the Kardashians are famous at all. But they're billionaires just for being fashion statements or whatever they are. I don't know. Do they sell clothes? or I don't know what they do. But they've got billions of dollars. And Kanye's got the ear of all kinds of people now. And it's a God thing that's happening there. And it's way different from what we've, what, anything we've experienced. John gets, catches a whiff of this new thing. He says, we're doing a church without walls. We're going to have church in our homes. We're going to just be Jesus for, for the people that we meet and see what God does with that. Okay, that's cool. I got no problem with that. I mean, what is church? What do we do here? We all come here, we get together, have a lot of fun, get a, get a, have some coffee, do some jokes, Charlie and I talk, we have fun, make some nice music, hang around, we practice the ukulele. We all love, we, we have a really nice time coming here. But is this where we do Christianity? Is this Christianity happening here? I mean, what is Christianity? Was the early church, were they doing Christianity? Christianity isn't something you do. It's something he is doing it in you, in your life, wherever you are. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We hear that all the time. And we don't understand it. Because if you peel back the original meaning of, of the Hebrew, it's we are made as the image of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh, easy for Jesus to say. No, but you were made as the imager of God. You've heard the phrase, you might be the only Jesus somebody's going to see today. Well, it's true. Are you doing Christianity? If we are the imagers of God, how are people who don't know God going to know him? Well, when they meet us, they should go, what the? That? Not because we wear freaky clothes or robes or quote scriptures or something. There, there's something made different about us on the inside that should be coming out to the outside. 24-7. You should sleep, Christian sleep. You should wake up, Christian praise. Thank God. Your mind has been changed because you've been reading the Bible. Your heart has been conditioned to love other people more. Let's do more of that. This church, this Christianity, has become something that we do on Sundays, and then everything else is just in between the church. 52 Sundays a year. We shouldn't be like the 52 out of the year Christians. It's something we are all the time, everywhere, to everyone that we meet. To our family, to our clients, to our fellow students, 
to our people on the bus, to wherever we are. Who was that masked man? You have an effect on people just by opening your mouth. What is that effect? What are you saying? Is Jesus coming out of your mouth? Is the love of God coming out? Is long-suffering coming out? Are you actually loving your neighbor? I mean, your enemy? Loving your enemy? How many of you have enemies? Really? That's something... Think about that. Just Sometimes, just by showing up, you can rile people's, people up. They're uncomfortable because you've got Jesus and they don't, they're in the guilt of their sins. Well, they want to put their daggers out at you. Well, do you put your daggers back out at him? No. You love that other person. They haven't, they haven't experienced that before. There's a, uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, I think this was a Lincoln quote, I don't like that man. I'm going to have to get to know him better. That's what we should be doing. Now, I came here this morning to talk about the changes that are going on here because there is um, an uncertainty when our, our uh, familiarity becomes um, threatened. We've got a, and I'm, not, I'm just talking, for, I didn't like prepare a big thing today. I want to talk to you as I'm from, I'm of you, we're the same. We all grew up in this church together. Everything that God does, all the shaking, is to work things together for good. He has a plan A. He doesn't have a plan B. He's working plan A. And if it means the wheel's coming off, of the megachurches, if it means that Kanye West is a, something that sweeps through and millions of people get saved as a result of this guy's conversion, get out of the way, folks. Let it happen. The church 20 years from now might not look anything like the way the church looks today. Get out of the way. Let it happen. Let it be. Unless the Lord build the house, they who labor, labor in vain. There's been a lot of vain, vanity, laboring, works, fleshly, man's ideas about how we're going to do church. What? I just, I don't want any of that. It hasn't worked. It's not my style. Not that it's, it's my choice, but I'm saying, every one of you is unique, different, something else to add, another facet to, to seeing the image of Christ. What, what this is going to look like 20 years from now, 10 years from now, 5 years from now, next year, I don't know. But I do know the grace message will be the key that unlocks the scriptures and the key that makes salvation make sense to people. And I think how successful some of the big Revival meetings, like the the Graham ministries and stuff. Did Billy Graham preach grace? Did he preach grace like Jim Kirkwood? No, Billy Graham's not a Bible teacher. He's not the guy you would you would go to for scholarly, biblical, you know, deep stuff. But boy, did he have he had a heart for the lost. Let's redo Billy Graham. No, 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 no. You're not paying attention. That's not it. Kanye West might be that Billy Graham now. I don't know. All I know is things are going to change. And I, and I, I, wanted, I want us to realize that the thing that changes is not God. It's plan A always. The rock doesn't move. The work is finished. The thing that changes is us. It's always been the thing that changes. When you were lost and dead in your sins and you found the truth of God's love for you and that Christ 
when you, you were as good as dead and he was with you on that cross that you deserved to be on and he went down to the grave with you and then he brought you up with him because if you had went on, down into the grave by yourself, you would have stayed there. He, brought you, he, he resurrected us to, to newness of life, changed us. We changed. Now, through his spirit, he's revealing more and more about, about the truth of God's word. He's re- re- revealing more about our salvation. It's, so, it's not some new prophecy. It's not some new ism. It's not, well, now we're going to have this and this revelation of this. No, it's all about Jesus Christ, what he did, and how perfect it was, and how all our response needs to be is to be a good dead person. Let him resurrect you. Because there's nothing left to do but to respond to him. Well, you better stop sinning. Well, you better start putting more money in the offering. Well, you better not. not. That's not in the equation. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay? I saw a a Bob Newhart uh, excerpt. It might have been like a Saturday Night Live mock-up of one of the Bob Newhart things, but it was with Bob Newhart. And uh, so you remember the show, he's a, he's a psychiatrist, and um, so he's in his office, and he, a new patient comes in. And she sits down across from his desk, and he says, okay, well, let me tell you how this works. He says, uh, now you tell me what your problems are, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some advice on what you should do. He says, I charge um, $5 for the first five minutes. And then if you like it, we can, we can go on from there. So he's, he says, he says, you're good for that? She goes, yeah. He, says, he puts his stopwatch on, turns it on. He says, okay, what's your problems? And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something, well, you know, every time uh, I get in my car, I'm, I'm afraid that, it, that it'll, be, it'll lock and I'll never be able to get out of it. And then it'll fall off the bridge and, I'll, and, and it'll go in, in underwater and I'll die. And he looks at her and he says, stop it! What? He says, stop that! She was thinking these thoughts, and she became afraid as a result. And he says, stop it! Was he right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you might say he was very insensitive to that, but if you boil it all down between the hand-holding and the 27 other things, you've got to get to the point where you just, stop it! Stop thinking that way! Well, the Bible tells us what to think. And Jim said a hundred times, if people knew the truth of, of, of salvation in Christ, the Bible shows you how to think, what to think. It renews your mind. You behold this, and you're transformed to be like him. The, the mental hospitals would be, would be mostly empty because people would think right. You know? Stop thinking the old ways. Start thinking in newness of life. Behold, God is doing a new thing. He's working his plan. We can get so easily distracted with all of these other things to do when the one thing to do is sit at the master's feet. Oh, but we got to make waffles. we got to be busy doing this in the kitchen. I stepped off the carpet. You're not supposed to step off the carpet up here. Or the rug, I mean. You know. Really... <laughs> Mary chose the best, the better part, which was sitting at the master's feet. So, behold, I do a new thing, says the guy who doesn't change. I'm the Lord, I change not. Oh, but I'm going to do something new. How do you reconcile those together? Did he not have, did he all of a sudden, hey, I've got an idea, said God. Never. The new thing is because he makes all things new, not once, constantly. The verse that says that that we have great, we've received grace upon grace, means it's an ever 
continuous dispensation of grace over you, like a waterfall that's always flowing. And we wonder if God's going to forgive us for something that we did yesterday. Constantly, he never leaves you or forsakes you. The newness is that it's always increasing and getting more glorious. The universe is expanding. According to the scientists. And it sounds like it's a thumb God would do. Got plenty of room. All things are possible to him who believes. So you mean we could do something new? All things are possible to him who believes. It's not all things except this. We need to think, really rethink the way we look at how we do things and what we're doing. Whatever the, the destiny of this congregation is, I see in you a willingness, a desire to stay together. We love each other. We share Jesus in a way that we found to be way, way more satisfying than what we hear from other churches, other ministries. And I, I don't think that's a prideful thing. I don't think it's anything bad or wrong. I don't think we're exclusive at all. We welcome all who come in peace. We're a colorblind church. We would just like more. I want more. I want more of Jesus, and I want more people. How many people does God want in the house? All of them. It's not his will that any should perish. He wants us all in the house. He wants us all to expand that garden of Eden all around the whole globe. And it'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Then it'll be him being our God, us being his people. We want everybody in that, in that picture. So what is soul winning going to look like in the future? What is discipleship going to look like in the future? Well, if we have anything to say about it, it's going to look a lot more like the Bible going to look a lot more like real love without dissimulation, with people actually engaging in, in strong interpersonal relationships, because we mean it. We really love people. Not because, well, we should. If you're the guy who thinks, well, I should, I ought to do this, or, I don't know, so you get in the front row, you sit here, and you listen to me or whoever's going to be teaching not here, because you don't should have anything. You don't have to ought to do. You don't have to do anything. Be a good dead person. You want to let the Holy Spirit lead you into this, doing whatever. Unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor, labor in vain. We're going to have a more frequent meetings with uh, what has been the ministry staff and uh, the board to talk about some of the future things. There's a lot of things in consideration. And I want us all to pray about what things might look like. Because the one thing I, I can tell you, it's going to be different. We might be in this building for the next 10 years and we might need to think about putting on an addition and fixing the parking lot and getting more nursery uh, workers and, and, and school teachers. Wouldn't that be nice? I can see that. We may be in an entirely different place. Does it matter if it's God? No, it doesn't. The familiar, this is familiar, I love the place. It's a great building, I love it. If that's going to change, can we put that on the altar? Are we, can we, are we willing to, to do that? I'm just putting out a hypothetical. I don't have any inside track on what's, what's going to happen. None of us do. If there was any, it wasn't even a financial pressure, and we were just here every Sunday, doing this. Six days out of the week, the building is empty. Might be another way of looking at things. Maybe we'll build one of those big lights and put it over some amphitheater and we'll rock out with some Jesus music, get a bunch of people saved. No, they only came to see Kanye West, I think. I don't think they come, probably. But all, all I know is that the rock is stable. It's our gyroscope. God is not shaken. If things get shaken, let them. There's people who are not here today. 
or the previous Sunday or the previous Sunday since John announced his, that he was uh, going to be leaving. Well, that's fine. If they were here to, for John, that's fine. It was cool. But you're not here for John Kirkwood. You're here for Jesus Christ and for the fellowship in the, of this body of believers. Because we've got something in common. We have an understanding of the grace of God that the world needs, that the churches need. And, you know, the, the job of whoever's speaking from here is to prepare you for the work of the ministry. Church isn't something that happens on Sunday. There's a preparation to be able to love unconditionally those people that you encountered during the course of the week. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I just wanted to um, address that and give you a perspective. God doesn't change. He's always working plan A, and it is good. So let me pray, and then Ken will sing the doxology. How does that sound? Okay. Father, thank you for plan A, that you love us, and it's always been your will to dwell among us. Where everything is beautiful, nothing hurts, as Kurt Vonnegut said in Slaughterhouse-Five, that it's peace that passes all understanding, that you provide everything as uh, the verses that, that Denise read this morning, that we cast our care on you for all things at all times, because you're a good God. You know what we need before we ask for it. We're living in an almost impossible-to-imagine universe that's life-giving and life-sustaining to us here on the planet Earth. Let's not worry about anything. Let's trust him. And Father, thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for giving Jim Kirkwood a laser focus on the grace of God that helped to set us free and help us to see Jesus more clearly. May we be that much more emboldened to reach out with love to those people in a lost and dark world so that they could see the life in us, the life of Christ in us. We could be in it, your imagers. Help us to be better imagers of you on this earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.